Kennedy to our joint event between um, the Somerville and Chelsea Kiwanis Clubs. We are very excited to have tonight's um, event. We're really excited about the subject material and feel very honored that we have Miss Jennifer Walter here with us today. Um, she is going to be sharing all of her um, knowledge with us. And I do hope that after the presentation, folks ask questions. Jen is definitely here to answer any questions people might have. Um, and if at any point, any of this conversation uh, becomes triggering or somebody needs assistance after the fact, please feel free to reach out um, to respondinc.org or um, our hotline number at 617-623-5900 for our support line if anybody needs assistance. I want to thank Ms. Sylvia for uh, joining us as she is the president of the Chelsea Club. Um, oh, look at you, you're so good. You've added your title into the, the message board. Thank you. Um, so Jen, would you like to take it away? I would love to. Thank you, Darcy. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'm honored to be here as well. So thank you all for this invitation. Um, I think this is certainly, it's funny when anytime someone says we are excited to hear about, I'm, like, I'm excited. I mean, this is, it's a heavy topic, not always um, the most exciting or the most uplifting, um, but hopefully it's useful. Um, it gives you, you know, a bit of a chance to learn a little bit more, um, hopefully have a, a network of support, um, have some guidance, some tips that, that you can hopefully use, um, not only with, with kids that might be in your life, but also um, you know with friends and peers and, and other adults, because a lot of this, of course, translates um, no matter what, what age um, we're looking at. So domestic violence, um, for those who are not sure um, or still question a little. Um, there's a number of different uh, definitions out there. I really focus on kind of four things. We're talking about a lot of different types of abuse. Um, a lot of people hear abuse instead of violence because violence makes people think of the physical. And of course, there's a lot of physical violence, unfortunately, out there. Uh, but when we're talking about domestic violence, we're looking at emotional abuse, um, things that are uh, you know, degrading or putting down others, um, manipulative, you know, threats, things like that. Um, we're looking at financial abuse. Um, you know, someone may have um, the control over the money um, or be kind of dictating what's getting spent and where. Um, there's sexual abuse, there is spiritual abuse, there's social abuse. Um, you know, there's a whole gamut uh, of different things because what it really comes down to is that we're looking at a relationship. So the people know each other well, you know how to um, manipulate someone better if you know them well. Um, but it's also really confusing on the victim end because this is this is someone that supposedly cares about you, loves you, and yet they're treating you in this, in this way. And, and if they know you well, and they know your sensitivities or weaknesses, right, they're gonna be able to abuse in ways that might not be as obvious um, to friends and family or the public or what we might kind of see or think about, you know, in movies and, and in the media. Um, it's also a pattern. We do see it um, often it's escalating, uh, but it is a pattern. We're not talking about, you know, a once off kind of mistake when you call someone a name. Um, we all have done that. So we're really looking at, you know, is this a pattern of abuse? Because ultimately, the person um, in this relationship that's being violent or abusive is looking for control. Their goal is to have power and control over the other partner um, or the family at large, or whoever is in that relationship with them. Um, and so that's what we're really looking at. It doesn't have to be a slap across the face. It's anything that is controlling or shifting the power dynamic so that all of that falls to one person and the other one um, 
you know, is feeling much more subservient or um, helpless, if you will, um, or needing to do what the other what the other partner is is asking all the time. So, when I'm talking about the effect this has on children, that's what I mean, right? I'm not just saying a physical fight between parents or siblings or other family members. We're talking about all those different types of abuse um, that they may pick up on in a household. So. First, I just want to clarify that um, more commonly people are starting to use the idea of children experiencing domestic violence. Um, a lot of times you might hear witnessing, um, but witnessing kind of ties us too much into a box, if you will, or kind of, you know, doesn't really encompass all of the things that we might want to think about. Um, obviously, there are those that might physically see things or overhear things, um, but they don't have to necessarily always be there either. Um, if the abuse happens when they're out of the house or when they are asleep, um, we know of course a lot of times people will say, oh, the kids were asleep, they didn't know what was going on. You know, they often still do. So, you know, even if they're just overhearing it, um, they might also be witnessing the direct aftermath Right, so they didn't see or witness the um, incident in any way, but they see the you know parent crying afterward, right, or their caretaker really upset or fearful later on, and so they are still feeling that that sense of fear that that a parent or other caregiver might um, might be feeling um, because of the abuse. Generally, you know, they're also just feeling unsafe for whatever reason. That's also, again, they don't have to witness anything, but that feeling um, can creep in. They might not even be able to describe where it's coming from, um, but they just have this gut feeling of things aren't safe in the home. Um, and it's important to remember, too, that, you know, a lot of children are used um, in the relationship. I mean, I think we've probably all seen it even just even in the healthier relationships, right? When there are, when there are concerns, the, kill, the children can be used as pawns, um, but especially by an abusive parent or caregiver, um, they know that that's probably something that their partner takes really seriously, cares about, it is concerned about. Um, it's actually one of the big reasons too that we, we see people not able to leave a relationship um, as early as they might like to, or we think they should, you know, as their support system, um, because there is a lot of concern over what's going to happen with the children, um, whether that abuser, uh, abuser will, you know, fight for the custody, whether they will, um, you know, take control of the kids in some way, whether they're going to hurt the children, um, or even just, you know, being without one of their parents. So, there's a lot of different ways that that children can actually be used by an abusive um, parent or caregiver as well. Um, and then, of course, as we know, they they can be the direct or indirect targets, right? If they happen to be in the room when something's being thrown across, um, you know, kids can unfortunately get hit or fall or or experience physical violence, even if they're not the um, primary target. Um, and then, of course, many many times too often they are the, the direct targets. So it's important to remember that all of these are traumatizing, right? They don't just have to see it or be abused themselves. Any of these things can be really traumatic and difficult and they all need to be addressed, um, you know, regardless of what others or you may think um, is the concern. If any of these things are a possibility. We need to really take it seriously um, and do what we can to help. So I got to throw in a little bit of the frustrating, scary, disappointing statistics. Um, you know, you're all here, so I think you know that this is a concern, um, but I don't think everybody realizes how common it really is. Um, so you can see one in 15 um, kids 90% of those are actually eyewitness. Um, so they are physically present and seeing it. 10% um, luckily don't witness it, but again, they have that feeling, they can sense the anxiety, they may overhear things um, or just in general feel unsafe. 15.5 million children um, 
live in a family where this has happened, um, 7 million where there's severe partner violence. Um, and so not just in the US, but worldwide, this is a huge concern as we, as we know and, and or probably can guess, right? A lot of different um, cultures, living situations, um, laws of the land, you know, a lot of different things can impact how common domestic violence is which of course then can impact all of the kids that are that are involved. So important to remember that that unfortunately even if we don't see it or aren't um, witnesses ourselves, um, this is happening to a lot of the kids and many aren't just like the adult victims are not going to be super forthcoming. So it is important that we we have these conversations and, and recognize the signs that that I'm going to share. This is a good example of kids don't always want to talk about it, um, but these were three different renderings. I'm going to give you a minute to look in detail of uh, drawn by children who were in a house um, experiencing domestic violence. So I'll give you a moment to just look at them and think about this before I continue. So of course, not having the children in front of us, um, whoever was working with them at the time, it, you know, we can make a lot of assumptions. Um, it's hard to know exactly what was happening, right? What was witnessed or seen versus perceived versus felt. But regardless, um, you know, we're seeing that their vision, right, or their portrayal of what's happening is scary, um, isolating. I mean, you see that, you know, father portrayed as a, as a devil. Um, obviously in the, in the second one, you know, we can assume the kids are under that table crying. You know, if they're under something, they're probably hiding. You know, it appears that um, what would look like a male partner is um, physically assaulting a female partner. Um, and that bottom one was done by, I think it was a 14 year old, 13 year old. Um, and it just, not only is the artwork amazing, but I think it's just really touching to show, you really feel the emotion um, of what these kids maybe can't put into words, um, but this is what they're seeing and what they're feeling and how, how they're perceiving their family um, or their situation at home. And so it is really important to give them the outlets um, to talk about this and, and do what we can to support them. So that said, um, and I, you know, I share this, this is something we often use in training um, as well. And so if, if anyone has questions or wants to talk more about this later on, feel free to call me, <laughs> the number's in the chat. Um, but I think it is, you know, it is important that we recognize when people say, oh, the kids don't know, right? The parents didn't necessarily know that this is what the kids were feeling and, and thinking. But they are affected just as adults might be. Um, a lot of research shows that any experience to trauma, they're gonna have very similar reactions, very similar symptoms that adults would have, um, especially when we're looking at, at PTSD, right? Um, so post-traumatic, um, stress disorder, post-traumatic, now I'm going to mess that up, right? Post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and so this is, you know, obviously the trauma of domestic violence um, first recognized when, you know, people are coming home from war, right? If there's death in the family, there's a number of different things. Um, and all of these behaviors that we see um, for the children are good signs to look out for, especially if this is stuff that we haven't seen previously and all of a sudden they're having nightmares or all of a sudden they're avoiding you or avoiding different activities that they used to be involved in. Um, you know, if they're starting to feel worse about themselves, um, a lot of times the, there's that obsessive thinking, they start to take control because they you know, feel they don't have control with what's going on at the home. And so they're gonna, you know, Maybe their sock drawer is going to be 
you know, obsessively organized and all the socks are in, you know, order by color and size or, what, you know, whatever else, because that's what they can, can take control of. Um, we also see a lot of, um, obviously, the outbursts, the irritability, anger, um, could be sadness, it could be anxiety, um, you know, a number of different emotions and feelings that are coming out. Um, and unfortunately, even beyond this, you'll start to see, um, and similar to that obsessive thinking is, it, we see a lot of children start um, acting out in risky ways, right? Finding um, risky behaviors again, because that that need to kind of have control and say, well, all this stuff's happening, but at least I can do this. Or, you know, they get some feeling of control. Um, we see, you know, you probably heard of it, you know, unfortunately those who are sexually abused, right, will often go out and start having more sex and probably um, not the healthiest sex because they're trying to kind of recapture that control. And while we think that, you know, that would be the last thing someone might want, for a lot of people that is the coping mechanism. So you know, looking for, for any of these signs, and it doesn't necessarily mean domestic violence all the time, right? But there is something bothering um, bothering the child if you're noticing any of these, these behavioral changes. Um, and the next slide that I have here is just to kind of break it down a little bit more um, with development, right? And the age that, that children might be. Um, I think one thing that's really important is recognizing that it there's no oh well they won't really be affected until this age no um you know there's a lot of research studies out there showing that even babies um you know a few months old are picking up on this right and it can be um you know based on their physical um you know distance or proximity to the violence it may be you know being held by a parent that is anxious or feel fearful or upset, um, you know, a number of things can trigger these responses um, in them very early on. Um, and so even if they can't communicate it, you may start to um, see some of these things. We see a lot of kids, you know, obviously the play therapy is big because they will act out things. Um, you know, I always remember this, the story of a, you know, a parent who thought, you know, my kid is always sleeping, they never hear anything. And then they go in and see them you know, one doll's hitting the other. Um, so obviously they are picking up on it somehow, even if they're, if they're not seeing it. Um, biting in kids, right? Acting out, hitting others, doesn't always mean <laughs> there's trauma at home. Um, but those kinds of things, you know, unable to kind of soothe or um, cope with difficult situations, um, you know, hyperactivity, a lot of those different things um, start to come about very early on. Um, and then you can see as, you know, they get older and into school age, right, it's going to actually start affecting their performance. Um, they'll have a lot more trouble um, in school. We'll also start to see a lot of social concerns. Um, one of the things that we're not going to talk a lot about today, um, you know, is, is the, the tendency for um, correlation with DV at home leading to teens or young adults being in unhealthy and abusive relationships. And, and that's something we work really hard um, on as well and getting into schools and talking with parents, you know, how can you identify that and, and, um, and help? Um, we do have on our website. So I think uh, Greta may be kind enough to, to put the link in our, in our chat. But there is, um, we did develop a, a guide that kind of helps with some of these conversations, helps parents identify um, the effects that unhealthy relationships might have. And, you know, the number one thing is really communication, right? Talking with kids, um, whether they're your own children or children you work with or, you know, nieces and nephews, um, neighborhood kids, um, you know, being a safe place for them to talk is really important. Um, and I'll go into that in a moment. But the last thing I wanted to point out, um, and some of you may have heard um, of these, but ACEs are um, adverse childhood experiences. And this is a very simple tool or score sheet. Um, you see there on the left, that first column are different um, 
situations or incidences that would be counted as an ACE or an adverse childhood experience. There are 10 of them. So someone can score from zero to 10. And what they're finding is that not only, you know, do we see that with a higher ACE score, um, kids and as they become adults are more likely to have some emotional or mental health concerns, but there's also a lot of physical, um, high blood pressure, you know, problem with the heart, um, diabetes. Um, and then of course you've got things like, you know, self-harming, suicide, um, all of those increase the more of these that children experience. So it is really important to recognize these, these early and really address them early so that they're not going down that path of having these, these adverse consequences you know, later in life um, that are much harder to, to, to face if you haven't been able to um, address it earlier on. Um, so again, lots of research on that. Google it, you'll find plenty on what, what ACE scores are and, and how that can affect. So after all that, no, oh, this sounds awful. <laughs> is there any hope? Yes, there is. Um, and so, you know, a number of the things that we try to share, um, you know, with parents, with caregivers, um, a lot of these are also things that you can do with peers. Um, so other adults in your life that, that you are concerned about, a lot of these carry over. Um, creating a safe word um, is a great way um, to communicate a little more subtly. Um, you know, this is something we also recommend with adults, right, is have some word or phrase that you can text to someone, um, you know, often by pointing out the abuse, you're going to escalate a situation. So, you know, if you say to a kid, go get the sugar, <laughs> can you go look to see if we have any sugar, you know, rather than, you know, your mother, your father's starting to lose it, run and hide. Um, you know, something that's more subtle is going to cue to a kid. Okay, here's what I'd like you to do um, without escalating the situation, right? Or making them feel um, uncomfortable, vice versa, right? They can kind of share something, um, say something to you when they're starting to feel fearful or uncomfortable. Um, you know, adding any structure, clear expectations, um, and that doesn't necessarily have to be in regards to the abuse, right? But just routine, right? This, we're going to still go to school. We're going to get you here. We're going to do this. Um, you know, having some of those um, clear expectations um, and routine in their lives is a soothing, um, soothing approach. Definitely paying attention to those nonverbal cues, um, right? Whether you see it coming out in play. Um, maybe it is kind of facial or body language um, cues, but it could also be, yeah, things in their play, things like, you know, they used to love basketball and now they just don't seem to want to play anymore. Um, things like that, that are going to tell you something's bothering them. Definitely avoiding struggles for power and control. We see, again, that's what abuse is, right? That's what domestic violence is, is the power and control. So if you can reduce that for them, um, you know, do not yourself try to gain control over them or, um, you know, entertain any behavior of them trying to gain that control. Um, and that's again, going to go back to those expectations, um, laying out clear boundaries and expectations is, is going to help with that. Um, and then modeling it, right? Um, modeling healthy relationships, modeling respectful relationships, um, and obviously you can do this even with strangers, right? So even if maybe there's not a lot in the household um, that you can use to model, right? When you're out in the neighborhood or um, with extended family, you know, really showing them and, and even explaining it um, to them of, you know, this is why I acted this way, or this is, this is how to be respectful. And then of course, everyone always asks us, like, what do I say? I don't know what to say. This is uncomfortable. And it is. Um, 
no one gets it right the first time. We don't know how, how someone's going to react when you, when you address some of this, but I think there are a few really important things that kids know that this is never their fault. Um, again, it might be something that might be a tactic. The abuser is going to say, you know, because of the kids, this, 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 but it's not their fault, right? They've done nothing. Um, this is the abuser wants control for whatever reason, um, has nothing to do with what the partner or the kids um, have done beforehand. Letting them know that this is not okay. This is not normal, right? It shouldn't be allowed. This is not just how life is. Um, you know, we, a lot of people that, that get stuck in this cycle and seem to go from, you know, violent to abusive to violent to abusive relationship. Um, you know, they say, this is just, this is how I grew up. I thought this was how it was. Um, and so making it really clear to kids that that's not the case. Letting them know you care. Um, again, it, the, the emotional toll that domestic violence can take, um, especially if it's an intimate partner or a parent, this is someone that you have been told is supposed to love you and yet they're acting in this way that doesn't seem to display that. Um, and so reminding them that you care, that others care about them, that they are important um, no matter what's happening, you know, with the rest of their family, um, they still hold that, that place um, for you. Uh, and then of course, they're not gonna be able to change it or prevent it. Um, and this is, this is also true for the victim of a domestic violence um, relationship, right? It, it really has to go back to that abusive caregiver or partner. Um, they need to take the responsibility. They need to change their behaviors. Um, it is not up to the victim or the survivor or the children um, to do that. They can't prevent it. Um, they can't change the situation. Um, what they need to do is keep themselves safe. Um, you know, that's, that's their only job is doing their best um, to take the actions, talk to you, you know, follow some of those safety measures that maybe you, you've put into place um, when things do get bad. So a few things kind of beyond that, um, beyond the support and really trying to work with kids to help them. Number one thing is show them the resolution, right? If kids see arguments um, or difficult incidents, even violent incidences, and then that's it, they don't hear about it again, they don't see anything else, all they're holding on to is that incident, right? They're not going through the, oh, okay, well, you know, and even if it's not an abusive relationship, right? Like, you know, mommy and daddy had an argument or, you know, your cousins just did this, whoever it is, you know, but here's how we worked through it, right? Or, you know, I know I did something poorly, like come with, watch me, I'm gonna come, I'm gonna go apologize. Do you wanna kind of come with me and see this? Like, let them see that resolution, let them understand how someone is coping um, obviously, the resolution doesn't necessarily always happen between caregivers or partners or the family, um, but in the sense of understanding how you take care of yourself after an incident like that is also a really good thing for them to um, be shown. You know, making sure that they still feel that attachment, that love, <laughs> right, the um, the strong relationship with the with the other parent or other caregiver or another adult. Um, you know, they need to have adults in their life that they can rely on and they feel close to. Um, so maintaining that that attachment, a lot of times we'll see, you know, parents who, you know, might be victims of domestic violence kind of almost shutting their kid out because they don't want to put more on them. Um, but doing that isn't helping, right? Keeping that relationship strong is, is the best thing. Um, and then like I started to say is, you know, maybe there are other adults um, that they can learn from or connect with, um, especially if the kids are in school. Um, there's a lot of counselors and more and more schools are recognizing this and really trying to put, um, put things in place. A lot of the um, local hospitals have some good programs um, that provide um, either groups or individual um, 
you know, whether it's play therapy or other types of therapy for kids, um, you know, so definitely helping them find that support network um, is important. And, and, you know, as they get older, those might change um, and that's okay. Um, but kind of helping them adjust and shift and finding more and more um, areas of support and more and more people that can support them. Um, and, you know, if their way of healing changes, helping them through that. Um, but it is a process. Um, it's a journey for sure. Um, you know, there's no way to say, okay, let's just do this and all will be well. Um, this is something that you've got to kind of continue to work on, to continue to have conversations about um, and continue to address, right? Again, I think even, you know, as we see in our, our work with, um, you know, adult survivors, uh, you know, it can be years later and they feel like they're okay and they hear something or see something that triggers them. Um, and, and so helping people throughout that whole journey is really important. And just remember, our kids are so resilient, <laughs> probably more so than us adults at times. Um, and so, you know, I think so often we worry, oh my goodness, like, these kids experience this, there's no hope for them. No, all of this is, you know, there's correlation, but there's no causation, right? Just like you can't assume that someone's abusive was abused as a child, because not everyone you know, who was abused or experienced DV in some way becomes abusive, um, right? Not everybody that, that has an alcoholic parent grows up to be an alcoholic, right? Paths can still be chosen. Um, you know, journeys can be detoured and diverted and, and change. You can even turn around at times. Um, and so, you know, remembering that kids can get through this and will um, with that support from, from you and anyone else in their life is really important um, because, you know, we wouldn't do this. Um, we wouldn't do our work if we didn't think we weren't making a difference. Um, and, and there are a lot of resources um, out there. So hopefully you can find them, take advantage. Um, and on that note, <laughs> um, just a few things here. I know Darcy um, earlier shared our website, um, responding.org. Um, Greta, I said, can put up some others in there. You can find um, some tools for parents. Um, National Domestic Violence Hotline is also um, a great resource. They've got a lot online there um, and their number is 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, Love is Respect is great. It's geared towards kids more so um, and really kind of looking at the relationships that they have. Um, there's a lot of great like one pagers on there on how to start conversations or, you know, how to know if, if you're a good friend or you're a good partner. Um, so I really, I love that, that website and we use a lot of it in our prevention work. Um, and then the last one there is, a, is actually local. Um, the um, Child Witness to Violence Project is local here in Boston. Um, and so if you do know of any young children um, that need extra professional support, um, they're a great place uh, to start. So that concludes everything that I wanted to share and, and get out there to start off. Um, we do want to open it up now for questions. Um, I think I know we, we kind of communicated this somewhat, but I'll remind everyone that we are recording this. Um, and, and Greta is, is our tech guru tonight, so she can uh, share more, but she will unmute. You can put in the chat. Greta, I'll kind of hand it over to you and I'm here to answer any questions. Thanks, Jen. Yeah, if anyone wants to be unmuted, I can do that. So you can just um, raise your hand or chat a question in the box and we'll read it aloud um, and have that answered. Um, if you have any other questions about resources or any other information, let us know. We did receive a question that about whether we would share the presentation, and we will. Um, you can email us at info at responding.org or uh, talk to your president, your club president, and we'll send those out to those folks. 
Um, we will also be, we are recording this as we said, and we will be sharing out that recording link as well. I know there's questions for you, Jen. I know there is. You did a great <laughs> job, Jen. I really always, I mean, I've heard this spiel maybe once or twice before, but I always learn something new, which is why I really enjoy listening. Um, I think this is a really great time too, you know, the, for um, Child Abuse Prevention Month. Well-timed. Um, I don't have a question. I have more of a comment. I think that presentations like this are extremely important and we definitely need to be advocates of uh, spreading the wealth uh, in the education aspect to more people. It is too bad that no more people joined us tonight. Um, of course, everybody has different uh, needs and, and, you know, and busy and work and whatnot, but I, um, this to me is like music to my ears because it's some of the things that we deal with on a daily basis at my job. And um, I, I would love for you to be available to provide this presentation to our staff. So maybe we should chat uh, offline or something like that. But thank you so much. It was extremely helpful. Yeah, and I think it's important to remember too, like our our number, we get this all the time, right? Not everybody that calls us is looking for services for themselves. <laughs> um, you know, we have a number of people that call for family and friends. Um, I, had, I had someone call a couple months ago about a neighbor, right? She's like, I hear this, I see this, like something's wrong. What can I do? Um, so, so yeah, I mean, we certainly, um, along with these other resources, are are not just for the the victims or survivors themselves, but you know, we're here to answer questions. Um, if you do have particular situations or concerns that that you want to just you know bounce ideas off of someone. I just want to echo what our club president um, Sylvia had to say. I when I reached out to Darcy on behalf of the club, this is exactly what I wanted to have as an opportunity for us to really answer and address and bring awareness uh, to such a really important topic. And um, I'm so glad to have this kind of collaboration with the, our clubs here uh, to be able to bring this information out. And I share Sylvia's sentiment and I wish that all of the, you know, the participants, you know, said 10 times this amount uh, rather than what we have, because I think there's so much in, in incredible information. I look forward to doing my best um, to share it um, as an individual, but also as an advocate for um, our club. So I, I can't say thank you enough, Jennifer and Darcy, for what a wonderful tag team uh, effort this was on your behalf to, to help us spread the, the word about this important subject. Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even say much. I, I know part of the reason I'm here is I've worked a lot with teens and, and youth and, um, you know, my background is is in education um, and a lot of that residential life um, with kids. And so, you know, this is something I think that's so important for them to learn about for them to understand, for adults to be able to have conversations around um, because it can be really scary and there's a lot of unknowns. Um, so the more of us, and I think, you know, it's important to remember like there's no right answer. Um, there's no perfect way to help. Um, but if you are open and willing to have these conversations and guide kids to the support they need, you know, then you're doing a fantastic job and that's, that's all we can ask. Jen, you alluded to it, but can you talk a little bit about the work that your team does in school? So working with kids directly and kind of how that prevention work um, kind of encourages kids to reach mm -hmm. out and, and some intervention work to happen. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So our, our, you know, the biggest area probably is around the kind of prevention and education. Um, and that can be as simple as 
you know, sitting in their cafeteria, um, you know, at lunchtime, when we're allowed to do that again, um, at a table, you know, where we've just got info. Um, we, you know, we make keychains and bracelets and different things that they can grab that have our number on them. Um, you know, we're there to answer questions. Um, so some of it can be really informal, um, but a number of schools um, and whether it's kind of a, a one class period um, or or a number of them kind of continuous lesson plans, we, we will go in and, and really, you know, talk through this with kids, run through different activities, um, allowing them to answer questions, you know, and really teaching them um, about this and not only for themselves, um, but also to support each other. Um, and from that, you know, we do get a lot of teens that reach out or, or want to talk with us about, hey, this, this is happening. How do I, I support someone? Um, at one school, we even um, do a group um, for the teens. And so they can sign up and we'll go through different, um, you know, relationship concerns and, and kind of some of the, you know, cultural and, and gender issues out there that are the hot topics. Um, you know, we help them in setting boundaries. Um, and, and then of course, with that, we're also, you know, talking with the teachers um, and others at the school. Um, and we've even done some um, parent nights and specific things um, to, you know, again, allow parents to better understand this um, and be able to, to, support, to support their kids as well. So, um, you know, this, all of these are pieces of things I've done. This is a new presentation. So really like, you know, you, you tell us what you want, we'll get in there and, and, and do it as best we can. Thanks, Jen. I think one of the, you know, um, most things that impact me the most was hearing from response staff when they go to teach um, at, at even sitting in the lunchroom or chat with the um, staff in the school. One of the th things every staff member said is I need 15 minutes after every presentation because there is always one kid at least in the class that needs to come up and talk, whether that is about their own personal relationship, whether that's their life at home and what they're experiencing with their parents or what they know is happening with friends and family. And that, I mean, I think about just a high school classroom and that every time they did that, they had to pause. And we wanna make sure that they have that, that, that time to pause, to be able to reach out, give these kids, um, a resource, a starting place. Here's where we can go to start this process. You know, we don't solve it in 15 minutes, but it's really great that we can, uh, that Respond can provide that service. All right, Greta, do you have any more, any more questions in the chat or is that it? All right, well, then I will say thank you to everyone for joining us. Thank you so much for the Chelsea Club for um, coming up with this wonderful idea for Respond, for um, pitching in and um, having this wonderful presentation, Jen and Greta, for all your technical support. We really appreciate it. And the Somerville Kiwanis Club, thanks to you all for joining. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everybody.